Hello everybody, this is Nick, and today I'm starting a new series of videos in which I'm going to be taking a look into some chosen uh, contest problems in programming. I'm going to be choosing these problems from various of sites, but the main site is Mendel.mk, which is a Macedonian site with very interesting programming problems for many different levels. It's C++ based and we're going to be working in C++ too. What I need to mention is that I'm going to translate every problem to English and have uploaded on my new blog nikov-problems.blogspot.com. Then first I'll, I'll solve it myself and then take a look at various of other methods to do so. For this episode I'm going to start with a fairly easy problem at first but actually it's much more intriguing a problem that has a lot to offer in the theory part on Mendo it is originally named Balling and has a pretty bad story that I won't even bother translating but the problem itself sounds something like this you have a pyramid or a triangle of numbers like this one starting from the top walking down going one step to the adjacent number, either to the right or to the left, until you've reached the bottom row. Your task is to write a program to find the largest possible sum considering the conditions above. Notice, the amount of rows can go up to a hundred. So basically, find me a sum, not like this one, like this one. In this case, the largest sum is 3 plus 7 plus 4 plus 9, that's 23. Okay, so if you want to solve it yourself, go ahead. If you're still with me, then let's explore and learn the math behind some great concepts. First of all, this concept of having numbers and connections like that is associated with graph theory. In graph theory, every graph has nodes that are connected with each other in some way. In this case, the nodes are the numbers and the connections are the possibility of moving to the right or to the left node on the adjacent down row. Now in this case, every node has just two connections coming out of it. And this looks like a tree structure too. In graph theory, this is called a, a binary tree. If you aren't familiar with graph theory, I would highly suggest to do it. But moving on, the first thing that popped up in my mind about solving this problem is solving it by brute force attack. So finding the largest possible sum by testing and comparing every possible sum path. For a small triangle, like a triangle with 15 rows, there are only 16,384 possible paths. So, not a big problem. But with, for example, 25 rows, there are 16,777,216 possible paths. The combinatorics formula is 2 to the power of the rows minus 1. So seeing that the amount of rows can reach 100, that would be 2 to the power of 99. That's something like 6.338 times 10 to the power of 29. That's huge number. Enough with numbers. We conclude that brute force attack would work with small triangles, but for big ones, it's just out of the question. The other method, and the best one, is to be clever and work backwards. Instead of calculating from the top down, we go from the bottom up. First, we don't process the most bottom row, we skip it. Then what we do is we start with the first node on the row second from bottom. And the main technique is to compare the children nodes which one is bigger. Add that value to the current node. So in this case we compare 8 and 5, we see that 8 is the bigger one and we add it to the current node, in this case the node with 2, it becomes 10. Then we just move to the next one. Now the current node is 4, we compare 
5 and 9. We see that 9 is the bigger one. We add 9 to 4, becomes 13. And we do this until we have finished with this row or layer. After that, we move to the next row and do the same thing. Compare, add. Compare, add. And then the next, compare, add. And as you can see, through a clever, fast and efficient technique, we get to the final answer and the correct one. In this case, 23. But we are here because of the code. So let's take a look at it. I first wrote an inefficient code that does the job with two dimensional vectors. Wait, uh, for those new in C++, vectors are just like arrays, but they can extend dynamically and have some better features than arrays. But that's for another topic. Then I saw that code from rosettacode.org and it was much more elegant. I just added the ability manually uh, the user to input the elements and modify it to the requirements of mendo.mk. First it inputs the number of rows and then with a slick formula for summing numbers from 1 to n, it calculates how many elements will be there in the vector. With the for loop inputs every element inside the one dimensional vector. So I didn't told you why one instead of two dimensional vector. Well, because with one dimensional vector it is faster in calculation terms. But in this case the computer power isn't a problem. But because of the slicker math I chose one dimension. After inputting the numbers into the array, it starts a loop which goes through the rows. It doesn't start on the last one as we discussed. It starts on the second from the bottom. Then on the second inner loop, it goes through each node in that row. But here, what is the interesting thing is how it does it. Because we use one dimensional array, the indexes of the nodes are like this. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on and so on. This requires some interesting math that you don't really see every day. As you can see, the first k value is inherited from a similar formula that I have showed you before. It is formula for summing numbers from 1 to n. It is n times n plus 1 over 2. But here instead of n plus 1 we see n minus 1. So why? Well because it accounts for the zeroth index. It is actually derived with changing the n to n minus 1. We get n minus 1 times n minus 1 plus 1 over 2. And we cancel minus 1 and plus 1 and we get the same formula. Still not here? Let's go through the code with an example. Let's grab the example from my block. It looks like this. First we input the numbers of rows in the integer m. Then we calculate the sum from 1 to that m number. In this case m is 5. The sum is 15. We loop and put the numbers into the vector. So far so good. Then we loop through the rows. Firstly we assign a value to n. That's going to be 4. Now we get to the interesting part. If we were to calculate the sum from 1 to n with this formula, it would be 10. And if our indexes would start from 1, 10 would be here. But we now reduce the n and calculate for n minus 1. We would get 6. And with indexes starting at 0, we would get exactly the node we want. Okay? Then we see another similar formula for the ending of the loop. Just this time it is n plus 2. Why n plus 2? Well, it shouldn't be in n plus 2, because it actually overflows the current row. But, there's a problem. If we would change the calculation to embraces just the current row, when we were to work with the zeroth node being k, i.e. the last loop, we would have a problem. And that problem can be fixed by adding just one more line of code 
specially designed for the last top row. But in this case, isn't worth the struggle. Because we don't lose a lot of power by calculating for few extra nodes for each row. And finally, the main line. Finding the bigger child node and adding it to the current one. That process will continue to the topmost row. That's why at the end we just print the final value of the top node. I hope you learned a lot of new stuff. Hope you liked the animations too. Did it all by myself. It really takes a lot of time to produce a video like this one. So please share, like, comment and subscribe. It really motivates me to do more. Don't forget to check out my other videos on this channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching.